All right, in this video, I'm going to be breaking down Paper Girls Volume 4. Last volume in Volume 3, the Paper Girls were in prehistoric times. And there they fought some cavemen. KJ even killed one of them personally. They also met Quanta Bronstein, the woman that invented time travel. And they met Wari and her son, Joppo. Now, Quanta Bronstein, Wari, and Joppo, they stayed there in the past in prehistoric times. But the girls got jumped to the year 2000. And that is where we will pick up the story in this volume. So let's dive into it now. Paper Girls, Volume 4. Paper Girls, Volume 4. Written by Brian K. Vaughn. Art by Cliff Chiang. Colors by Matt Wilson. Letters by Jared K. Fletcher. Issue 16. Picking up from last volume... The Paper Girls have now been transported to the year 2000. Specifically in the early hours after the year changed from 1999 to 2000. Tiffany was transported out front of an Applebee's where a cop is arresting her as he suspects her of being one of the many looters taking advantage of the Y2K blackouts. Now, for those of you young people out there that are unfamiliar with the hysteria around Y2K, in the year 1999, a lot of people were concerned that when New Year's happened and the year changed from 99 to 2000, that all of the computers in the world would screw up and lead to worldwide anarchy because they thought computers couldn't handle the digits of the year going from 99 to 0. Computers would think it was the year 1900 instead of 2000. In the end, it turned out to be not a big deal, but the news media did hype it up as something that would be potentially post-apocalyptic. Now, in Paper Girls, it appears that their time traveling to the year 2000 has led to some electricity blackouts on this particular night which leads some people in Stony Stream to believe that Y2K is actually happening and the world is maybe ending and some of that stuff is coming true. Elsewhere, we see Grandfather, who is looking much younger now. He is talking to a woman named Prioress. They are looking at a viewing screen. Their analysis shows that various teenagers from the time stream have come into the year 2000 and are causing trouble. Prioress asks if they should prep the troops for ablution. Grandfather replies, This isn't just another cleanup job, Prioress. These people have willfully violated every article of the Concordat. They've declared war on the entire timeline. Prioress and Grandfather continue walking through their base and decide what to do. Back to Tiffany. The cop is hauling her away assuming her to be a looter. In the background, two giant mech robots are fighting. Tiffany is freaked out by them, but the cop seems oblivious to the giant robot fighting going on. It seems Tiffany is able to see the robots, but the cop cannot. The cop puts Tiffany in the back of his cruiser vehicle and drives off. Over to the Stony Gate Mall. KJ, Mac, and Aaron are all together. When all four of the Paper Girls got jumped from the prehistoric era to the year 2000, it seems Tiffany got separated. She got spit out near the Applebee's, but the other three girls got sent to the inside of the mall. The girls begin looking around the mall, and they figure out that it doesn't look futuristic enough. It is clearly not the year 2055, which is where they were expecting to be sent. In the mall, they see some looters making off with a flat screen TV. And that flat screen TV cost $10,000, apparently. <laughs> the box on the TV says that it is only five inches deep. The looters ask the girls, you ladies getting in on the end of the world discount too? The girls ask, end of the world. The looter explains, you know, because of the millennium bug? I heard it already made a bunch of planes fall out of the sky. The girls ask the looters, what year is it? 
the one looter points to his novelty year 2000 glasses, and then him and his friend take off with the TV. So the girls realize they are in the year 2000? Erin is confused. She says to her friends, this can't be the end of the world. We already know it still exists in 2016. Aaron, KJ, and Mac think that they have to look for Tiffany. Aaron has an idea of someone who might be able to help them. She says they are going to need to find a phone book. Elsewhere, Tiffany is in the back of the cop's car. The cop doesn't see the giant robot on the road in front of him because it is invisible to him. But Tiffany, she can see that robot and she screams as the cop is driving, watch out! But the cop, he just drives straight into the invisible robot and crashes the car. Back to Aaron Mac and KJ. Aaron, last volume, mentioned that those teenagers they met, Heck and Naldo, well, they were trying to look for hidden messages in the newspaper's comic section. But Aaron had no idea what specific comic strip or what hidden messages. The girls also learned from Quanta Bronstein last volume that the Apple device that they were using was registered to someone named Frankie Tomata. Quanta said that name was probably a fake one. It's so obviously fake. But why would that Apple device be registered to this fake name Frankie Tomata? Erin felt like she heard that name before. Because it turns out Frankie Tomata is the name of a comic strip in their newspaper. And Aaron figures that that is not a coincidence. This Frankie Tomata comic strip must be tied into everything. It must be the specific comic strip that Heck and Naldo were looking for hidden coded messages in. KJ and Mac, hearing Aaron's explanation, ask her, Hidden messages, hidden by who? Aaron looks in the phone book and answers, Well, the cartoonist for Frankie Tomata is named Chuck Spacechevsky, right? And sure enough, there is exactly one C. Spacechevsky that lives right here in Stony Stream. So the girls, they walk across town to where this supposed Frankie Tomata comic strip author currently lives. When they knock on the door, an old woman opens it, and she says, Oh, thank goodness you found me! Aaron says that they are looking for Chuck Spacechevsky, and the old woman replies, Oh, that's me! Charlotte is my name, originally. But Dad told me that no one would ever buy a strip from a lady cartoonist, so she wrote under a pen name. So this woman, Charlotte Spacechevsky, seems to be an ally of sorts to the teenagers like Heck and Naldo, and she uses her comic strip to send them messages. Charlotte, she ushers the girls inside her home. She tells them, now get inside before an old timer sees you. KJ asks, Charlotte, ma'am, were you expecting us? And Charlotte replies, as soon as the lights went out, you people haven't made an entrance like that since 92. Mac asks, Lady, what's going on here? You know who we are? Charlotte replies, Of course, silly. You're time travelers. I'm only your biggest fan. Charlotte now is in front of some sort of conspiracy theory wall in her home with tons of time travel stuff taped to it. Issue 17 Tiffany is still alive in the back seat of the now crashed cop car. Above her is a giant robot being piloted by the teenagers we met in the first volume, Heck, Naldo, and Jude. Heck, Naldo, and Jude are in a big silver mech robot, and they are battling the old timers, Grandfather and Priorus, who are piloting this other big red mech robot. The teenagers in their mech fire a projectile at the old-timer's mech, and the old-timer's mech shifts the projectile one minute into the future so it misses them. The two mechs then run at each other, and they start slugging it out. 
they were having themselves an old-time robot boxing match. Back over to Charlotte's house. Charlotte asks the girls if they are indeed from the future, but the paper girls explain no. They were born in the year 1976, and they jumped in time from 1988. Charlotte realizes that the girls are just displaced civilians in this time war. Charlotte gives the girls a little history lesson on what she's learned. Charlotte explains all about something called the Battle of the Ages between the teenagers and the old timers. Charlotte is not a time traveler herself. She just happened to meet one when she was younger. She met Jude, one of the teenagers, who is originally from the year 70,000. All of a sudden, a big explosion goes off outside, probably from all the robot battling going on, and it created a hole in the side of Charlotte's home. Charlotte tells the girls that the old timers will soon be firing their amnesia rays all over the area, but Jude taught her how to protect herself from their side effects. Charlotte, she ushers the girls into her cellar. The girls are hesitant to go into this strange woman's cellar, but Charlotte tells the girls, please, I have equipment down here that might help you locate your missing companion. As a wise man once said, come with me if you want to live. She's quoting Terminator there. Across town, the robots are continuing their fight. Tiffany wakes up in the back of the cop car, and she kicks out the window, and she climbs out of it, and she drags the cop with her to safety as the cop car then explodes. Tiffany, she then gets to see the old timers, restorative technology, go to work. A whole bunch of old timers drones fly down. Now they have the ability to actually reverse the damage to the cop car. They flip the car right side up and they put it back to its exact condition it was in before it crashed. And then the drones continue on their work. Tiffany, she runs away from them. She decides that she should maybe try and get to her parents' house here in the year 2000. Back over to Charlotte. Charlotte brings Aaron, KJ, and Mac down to her basement. And in that basement, she has a tangerine iMac, and she begins pulling up some data on it. Charlotte explains that she tracks various time foldings on this computer. It's one of the things that Jude taught her when he came to visit her way back in 1958, when she was much younger. She found Jude hiding in her basement. Charlotte comments, He didn't stay long, but he taught me a great deal in our time together. A great deal. Mac gets a little creeped out and asks Charlotte, Ew! Did he try to bone you or something? Charlotte says, Oh, not at all, but we have a deep and lasting friendship. Charlotte tells the girls what Jude told her. She says, Jude explained that when time travel was first attempted, the experiment inadvertently created small creases throughout the fabric of space-time, and these so-called foldings can be used to journey into the past or future, but they can only be detected at the moment that they appear in the present. For centuries, time travelers have relied on locals like me to spot exactly when and where these time foldings materialize. The tricky part is somehow relaying those details to allies like Jude without the information being intercepted by others like the old timers. That is where the comic strip comes in. Charlotte's father started drawing Frankie Tomata way back in the 1930s, and he used to include lucky numbers in the comic strip for, you know, people playing the lottery and whatnot. But after Charlotte took over the strip, she continued on the tradition of putting in those lucky numbers, except now the lucky numbers were actually a cipher or coded message that she can toss into the time stream and help the teenagers know the location of time folds. So for example, 
peck Jude and Naldo or in a particular year. They can pick themselves up a copy of the Cleveland Preserver newspaper, and they can look at the Frankie Tomata comic strip. And above that comic strip, there'll be a series of numbers. Most people think it's just for people playing the lottery, but those numbers are actually a hidden message telling them where and when a time folding opened in the past. And then at some point when they jump around in time again, they can now rely on using that time fold if they need to jump some more. Mac and KJ are near the back of the room and they're whispering a bit. Mac tells KJ, I don't like this cage. You see the way that crazy old lesbo is looking at Aaron? KJ replies, Mac, when I grow up, I think I'm going to be a lesbian. I think maybe I'm a lesbian already. Mac is startled by KJ's revelation and asks, Wait, what did you say? Charlotte, looking at her computer in various time folds, tells the paper girls that their friend Tiffany most likely got spit out a few minutes ago, not far from here. The girls are happy to hear that. Maybe they can find Tiffany. Charlotte pulls a gun out and points it at the girls. She tells them no, it's far too dangerous for them out there. She can't risk them being found by the old timers, as they already know too much. Over to Tiffany. Tiffany arrives at her family home. Tiffany's future self would be about 24 years old at this point in time. Tiffany, she goes in her home and she looks around her house. And she finds a mysterious looking goth man named Chris, who has black nail polish on and long hair and eyeshadow. Chris asks Tiffany, may I help you? Tiffany answers, who are you? Chris says that he was going to ask her the same thing. Tiffany lies, saying, I'm, uh, I'm a friend of the family that lives here. Do you know Tiffany Quilkin? Chris answers, yeah, she's my wife. Tiffany is in shock, and she has a surprised Pikachu expression on her face. Issue 18 Charlotte, pointing her guns on Aaron, KJ, and Mac, tells the girls all the dangers coming in the future, she says. The young time travelers I met told me stories. Stories of anthrax in mailboxes, of airplanes flying into skyscrapers, of, of, of people addicted to their phones. The old timers want these awful things to happen because for them, they already have happened, but their enemies, my allies, believe every generation has a right to live in the best possible present, even if history has to be futzed with to get there. KJ tells Charlotte that, yeah, we're on their side. Charlotte, she is still nervous, though. She replies, don't take another step, KJ. I'd give my life for this cause, and I'm certainly ready to take yours. Aaron, she throws a newspaper at the generator in Charlotte's basement, and she hits the generator and the power goes off, and the lights go dark. Remember, because of Y2K, but actually because of the time travel going on, power and all of Stony Stream currently is down. With the lights off, the paper girls begin running upstairs. Charlotte, she actually opens fire a bit, but she misses. The paper girls get out of the basement, and then they close the door behind them and shove a dresser in front of it to keep Charlotte away from them. The three paper girls then leave the house and travel on. The giant mech robots are still slugging it out. Over at Tiffany's house, her and her future husband, Chris, are talking. Young Tiffany is very unimpressed with her future husband and finds him really weird. Tiffany asks Chris if he is some sort of time traveler, you know, because of how he looks. Chris does a sarcastic laugh and says, ha ha, make all the hacky jokes you want. Tiffany and I don't care what people think of the way we dress. Young Tiffany is horrified over Chris's use of the word we. What does her future self look like if her husband looks like this? Young Tiffany asks Chris where 
Tiffany is, you know, referring to her older self. Chris explains that they were having a New Year's Eve party, but then the power went out and everybody went home and they took all the beer too. So Tiffany left to go get some more before everything gets all cleared out. Tiffany asks where Tiffany's parents are. Chris says, ah, they're in Europe, blowing mine and Tiffany's future inheritance away. After talking a bit more, young Tiffany decides to come clean and tell Chris that she is a time traveler. And she is actually Tiffany back when she was 12 years old. Young Tiffany wonders why Chris doesn't even recognize her. Outside, the robot mechs continue battling. Grandfather and Prioress are in their mech, and they lose sight of the teenager's mech. Grandfather thinks that maybe they went invisible? The teenager's mech comes from even further in the future than their technology. Prioress says that the bastards must have figured out how to jump upstream. Prioress, she gets ready to launch some sort of tactical nukes on the teenagers once they show themselves again. Grandfather tells her, easy Prioress, I don't think we're quite at the point of using tactical nukes yet. Prioress replies, says the man who declared this chicken shit invasion an act of war. Grandfather says that, hey, their side plays by the rules, unlike their opponents, the teenagers. Prioress argues, their weapons are millennia ahead of ours. Playing fair against these psychopaths is suicide, Grandfather. Grandfather tells Prioress, will you please just use my real name when you talk to me? Prioress says, I won't because there's a reason you are elected to that position. We believed it when you swore to preserve humanity's first draft at any cost. Grandfather says that if they use nukes here in this area and kill and irradiate all these people, then they are no better than the teenagers. Prioress counter argues saying, Whatever collateral damage we're forced to inflict on this one neighborhood will barely make a dent in the long-term continuity of Earth's timeline. But if we don't stop these delinquents right now, right here, then the entire past, present, and future is completely screwed. Aaron, KJ, and Mac continue walking around Stony Stream. Along the way, they see that cop that Tiffany saw earlier. That cop's mind has been altered by the old timer's amnesia machine. The cop drives by the girls and tells them in an almost robotic way, please do not worry, all shall be done and forgotten. Please do not worry, all shall be done and forgotten. And the cop, he continues driving. KJ comments how disturbing that sounded. Back to Tiffany's house. Young Tiffany shows Chris an old yearbook, and she proves to him that she is in fact young Tiffany. And Chris, he believes her. He says, man, this is some genuine 12 Monkeys shit. 12 Monkeys was a movie from the year 1995 all about time traveling and time loops and stuff. Tiffany does not get the reference. Chris apologizes for not being able to tell young Tiffany was in fact the same woman he ended up marrying. He explains that the Tiffany that he met at NYU Business School looked very different. Young Tiffany is puzzled and she wonders, ew, business school? Her future self studied business? There is some knocking on the front door of Tiffany's home. Tiffany and Chris open the door, and on the other side is Aaron, KJ, and Mac. They found Tiffany's home, and, and came to look for her here, and luckily they found her. Mac, she takes a look at Chris and asks, Who the hell is this vampire? <laughs> Tiffany ushers them into her home. She asks them, How do they not see what's going on outside? Referring to the giant robot fight going on. For some reason, Tiffany 
seems to be the only one who can see the robot battle going on. Even Aaron, KJ, and Mac can't see the robots. The mech robot fight outside continues. The silver mech robot of the teenagers gets the jump on the old timer's mech, and it punches their mech down with such force that the old timer's red mech falls to the ground, and the controls jam, and the mech gets destroyed. Grandfather and Prioress are injured inside the mech. Grandfather will live, though, but Prioress has been impaled by some metal, and she doesn't have long to live. Prioress, now that she is moments away from dying, decides to call Grandfather by his real name and not his grandfather title. Prioress tells Grandfather, Don't do it, Japo. I know you'll want to break the rules, but you can't change the... Prioress then passes away and dies. Now this is actually a little bit of a mind-blowing revelation. Prioress called Grandfather Japo. Japo was the name of Wari's son we met in Volume 3 in prehistoric times. So Grandfather and Japo are one in the same! Grandfather in Volume 2 stated that 2016 was the year his mother was born, but clearly Grandfather was mistaken about that. How did that little boy from 11,706 BCE come to be in the future and become this grandfather figure? Those are answers that will come later. Someone on a radio in the mech calls in to Grandfather, and they ask Grandfather if they can now take lethal action. Grandfather, he was against doing this before, but he decides to give that permission. He says, spread the word that the rules of engagement have been revised. You are now authorized to perform last rites on all of them immediately. Issue 19 Chris and the four paper girls go to Tiffany's basement to hide from all the destructive noises of the robot battling that is happening outside. Tiffany is still the only one that can see them. Aaron theorizes that maybe the robots have cloaking devices like the Klingons in Star Trek IV The Voyage Home. Chris says he doesn't care what's outside. He wants to go find his wife and make sure she is okay. Young Tiffany says she wants to go with Chris and find her future self. All the paper girls agree to go and help. We see adult Tiffany at a convenience store trying to buy some beer. Adult Tiffany is 24 years old. Her hair is in dreads and it is dyed red. And she has piercings and tattoos on her face. She definitely kind of matches Chris with her odd appearance. The convenience store employee does not let Tiffany in as he is freaking out about Y2K stuff. Teenagers Heck, Noldo, and Jude have left their big mech robot, and they are now wearing their bandage cloaks, and they are running around. And they come across adult Tiffany and aim at her. Eventually, they realize she is not a threat, and they point their guns down, and they move on. Some of Grandfather's soldiers have located the abandoned mech of the teenagers. The soldiers report to Grandfather that the kids inside escaped into the general population on foot. Grandfather tells the soldiers over the radio, They're not kids! They're terrorists! Now find them, and bring me their goddamn heads! As Chris and the paper girls walk around Stony Stream, heading towards adult Tiffany, some of the mechs are still walking around in the background. Tiffany is looking at one of them, and that mech seems to explode, but not like a normal explosion. It was more like one of those trippy blasts, like the ones that launched the paper girls here when they time traveled. Tiffany 
tells the other girls what she just saw. Aaron theorizes that maybe the robot mechs are time machines themselves. KJ hopes that is true as maybe they can hitch a ride on one of them and get back home to 1988. Finally, Chris and the paper girls find adult Tiffany. Young Tiffany and adult Tiffany lay eyes on each other. Adult Tiffany is in shock at seeing her younger self. She then vomits a bit. Adult Tiffany then sees Mac and recognizes her as well from when she was a paper girl in her youth. Adult Tiffany, like young Tiffany, is also able to see the giant mech robots around. And she is freaking out a little bit from seeing them. Something about Tiffany, specifically, allows her to see these robots, both young and old. But none of the other civilians here in this time can. As a group, they all decide to travel to a local nearby church and hide out there until everything finally blows over. As the panel zooms out, we see all of Stony Stream from a distance, and we see many of the old-timers red mech robots walking around. Chris, adult Tiffany, and the paper girls arrive at the church that was luckily empty. They make themselves comfortable, and they talk a bit. Eventually, though, they do get interrupted and found by grandfather's soldiers. The soldiers tell the girls, you have no right to be in this era. KJ, using her boots that she retrieved last volume, she propels herself across the room and she tries to save her friends, but she gets slammed down by one of the soldiers. Chris asks, what is wrong with you people? They're just children. The soldier, he decides to zap Chris with his weapon. The weapon doesn't kill Chris, but instead transports him by time shifting him to a nearby place for processing, where his mind will eventually be wiped of all of these memories, and then he will be put back into his normal place. So Chris is zapped and sent elsewhere. The soldiers then get ready to zap the others, but then before they can do that, all of these soldiers get shot with gunfire, and they go down. Charlotte Spacechevsky was the shooter. Charlotte, she tracked the girls here by following their footprints, and arrived in the church and killed Grandfather's troops in there. Charlotte tells the girls, I told you this was going to end badly. Issue 20 Charlotte asks the girls if anyone is hurt. Tiffany, young and old, explain how the soldiers here vaporized Chris, her husband. Charlotte is wondering who these two people are, who Tiffany is. Aaron explains that Tiffany is their friend, both of them. Eventually, Charlotte learns that young Tiffany is from 1988 and older Tiffany is from here in the present in the year 2000. Charlotte says, oh, don't worry, dear. If the young man they zapped is also from here in the present, odds are he wasn't killed. He's merely been time-shifted for processing. The old-timers live to maintain the status quo. They do everything in their power to make sure that no time period shows any lasting effects of visitors from other eras even if it means the local population has to get a little brain damage to make sure they forget. Young Tiffany asks if they can save Chris. Charlotte replies, he's likely already been placed back in his own bed, completely oblivious to the evening's events. But those of us who don't want the truth ripped out of your gray matter need to follow me back to my cellar. Aaron, she thanks Charlotte for her offer, but tells Charlotte that they are instead going to try and hitch a ride on one of those robots out there and take it back home to 1988. Charlotte asks, what robots? Aaron explains, um, somehow the Tiffany's can both see whatever's making all those terrible noises out there, ma'am. Mac adds, 
Either that or they've been bullshitting us this whole time. Charlotte says, okay, no, 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 it, it makes sense. If your friend came through that folding at a different angle than the three of you, then she may have gained a unique perspective on the events going on out there. Before Charlotte can continue talking, she gets zapped by one of Grandfather's soldiers that was on the ground of the church. They presumed him dead with a bullet wound, but he was actually still alive. And the soldier, he must have set his weapon to kill instead of just transporting Charlotte away. Because when that soldier zapped Charlotte, her body lit up and caught on fire and she died. Aaron, she goes over and kicks that soldier in the head, knocking him out. The girls, they all decide to leave the church now. Meanwhile, we see Heck, Naldo, and Jude. They go to their time machine capsule that they hid in the sewer, and they, we assume, jumped to another time. As all the girls are walking to one of those time machine robots that young Tiffany saw go down earlier, adult Tiffany takes this opportunity to talk to her younger self. Adult Tiffany tells young Tiffany that she wants to come with her. She wants to go back to 1988. She could help avert various disasters like the Unabomber, Oklahoma City, that terrorist attack underneath the World Trade Center, and her life. Adult Tiffany admits that her life didn't turn out like she wanted. She loves Chris and is grateful for everything that she has, but deep down, she always felt like something went wrong somewhere along the way. I mean, how did she end up going to business school when she was a kid she wanted to make things, be an inventor or an engineer? Young Tiffany tells her older self, <laughs> You know, uh, when we met the scientist who invented time travel, that's exactly what she told me I should be. Now, Tiffany is referring to Dr. Quanta Bronstein, whom we met in Volume 3. Adult Tiffany is pretty excited to learn that time travel was invented by a woman. Eventually, they all arrive at the abandoned mech robot that Heck, Naldo, and Jude were piloting earlier. Young Tiffany wonders if she can use this soldier's wand weapon thing that she took and give the mech a jump start, as right now it's not turned on. And sure enough, she zaps a little electricity at the mech, and it boots up. The mech then lowers its palm to the ground, and the girls climb onto it, and then the mech lifts them up to its head. Grandfather's soldiers have been monitoring this mech, and they become alarmed when it turned back on. One of these soldiers, named Alter Girl, tells Grandfather, Grandfather, it's back online. The Stomper, sir. The one that killed Priorus? Grandfather theorizes the boys who abandoned it must have come back with repairs. Well, Grandfather was wrong when he thought that. But nevertheless, Alter Girl says, Well, we're timestamping the target so we can at least track its location if they try to escape. Grandfather tells Alter Girl to not give them a chance to escape. Kill everyone inside of it now! The paper girls and adult Tiffany are inside the mech. Adult Tiffany sits at the controls and tries to figure out how to drive it. And somehow she seems to get it working and she activates the time travel ability in the mech. Grandfather, he arrives in an even larger stomper mech vehicle. And as that mech vehicle goes to stomp down on the vehicle the Paper Girls are in, the Paper Girls manage to teleport away and jump through time and avoid being destroyed. Grandfather asks Alter Girl, well, did we bloody get them or not? Alter Girl replies negative, they've jumped to the one place we're not allowed to follow. The future. Our future. Grandfather replies, well, then we can still get them. We just have to do it the old-fashioned way. Through patience. Patience. The Paper Girls do a time jump, and they get spit out into Lake Erie. When the girls look at where they are, they see a very futuristic city, complete with flying cars and what looks like a flying train or something. 
Mac seeing this comments, holy shinola. Now that's what I thought the year 2000 would look like. And that is the end of volume four. The girls are no longer in the year 2000. They are in the future. All right, that was volume four of Paper Girls. Now, in this volume, we learned a lot of time travel rules and lore. A lot of it coming from this Charlotte woman and her information dumping a whole bunch of stuff on us. And I think it is really fun to try and figure some of these things out. However, I'm not going to lie and say I wasn't a little confused following all the rules of how the time travel works here, but still... I'm here for the ride, and I think in the end, it'll all make sense when the series wraps up. I uh, really liked the reveal of this volume that Grandfather is actually Joppo, and that is a kind of a mind-blowing twist. So uh, I did love that uh, thing in here. I really had fun with young Tiffany and adult Tiffany meeting, and adult Tiffany looking very weird, and her husband and young Tiffany is just like very freaked out by it. <laughs> so there was some really fun interactions between the two of them. We also had some giant mech robot battles, which was pretty fun. So I had a good time this volume, and I like how we ended with this cliffhanger of them in the future. Very exciting stuff. I'm going to give this volume an 8 out of 10 as well. Thank you all for watching, and I'll be back next week with volume 5.